Okay, so we're picking up in, in the middle of 24 at verse 10. Um, let's start with verses 10 through 13, and I'm going to start this okay. way, Brenda. When you make your neighbor a loan of any sort, you shall not enter his house to take his pledge. You shall remain outside, and the man to whom you make the loan shall bring the pledge out to you. And if he is a poor man, you shall not sleep with his pledge. When the sun goes down, you shall surely return the pledge to him, that he may sleep in his cloak and bless you. And it will be righteousness for you before the Lord your God. Um. Before everything else, Millie's online. Everyone say hi, Millie. Hi, Millie. <laughs> okay. Um, so this is about loaning, um, giving a loan to your neighbor. Now, your neighbor is talking, like Jesus talked about, who is your neighbor? For them, it was any fellow Israelite. You could not charge them interest. But you could take collateral. Um, so this is about allowing the borrower to keep their dignity. The person lending whatever it was. It wasn't money because they didn't have coins. But whatever they were lending. They could not go into that the borrower's house and decide what was going to be the collateral. Oh, that's they had to stand outside, and the person doing the borrowing got to choose what the collateral was. So it may seem kind of strange when it says if he's a poor man, you can't sleep with his collateral. Yeah. That's because what they, a poor person, especially what they would use as collateral is clothing. Usually their cloak. Um, so if you took a poor man's cloak from them, that's what they slept with. So you weren't allowed to keep it overnight. So I don't doesn't say whether you go take it back during that night and pick it up in the morning again and take it back and doesn't say that. It says return the cloak to its owner by sunset. So yeah, but then the next morning do you pick it up pick again? It, up again? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it doesn't say that. Mm -hmm. But the point of this is you you allowed the poor person to keep their dignity. And to survive and keep warm. Um, we see in Amos 2, we will see somewhere in the future. In Amos 2.8, that Amos condemns them for not doing this. For keeping people's clothing. So later, much later, we know they're not doing what they should be doing. We don't know about how well they're doing that. At this point, that, um, again, the thing is, allow the person to keep their dignity. Don't shame them. Okay, verse, we're going to back up and we'll go verse 14 and 15 in chapter oh, 24. Oh, we can come back to you. Okay. Okay. Uh -huh. Oh, you got it? Uh, 14. <laughs> 14, 15. Uh, do not take advantage of your hired worker who is poor and needy, whether the worker is a fellow fellow Israelite or foreigner uh, residing in one of your towns. Uh, pay them their wages each day before sunset because they are poor and are continuing on it. Otherwise, they may cry to the Lord against you, and you will be guilty of sin. Okay, so this is take care of the people that work for you. Because they're working for you for a reason. They need to um, survive. So they're working for you. Now, workers were typically paid every day. Because they didn't have refrigerators, they didn't, you had to take care of, you had to get your food every day. And if you were poor, you didn't have your own land to get your own food, so um, they were paid daily. And this is saying, make sure you pay them every day. And this applies to both your Hebrew neighbors 
and the non-Hebrew neighbors, anyone working for you. Um, and the person working for you is working in anticipation of getting paid that day. And if he isn't paid, it says the man will cry out to God. And God's going to hear him. Um, in James 5.4, it warns the rich man who oppresses the workers. Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your field, which you have kept back by fraud, cry out. And the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of the Sabbath. So, both Old Testament and New Testament say these workers are going to cry out to God if you don't pay them. So pay them when they're supposed to be paid. No man should have to plead for um, the pay that they've earned. And if the, if the owner, whatever, doesn't um, pay, he is guilty of sin. Do the slaves live with them? Or do they have a home? Uh, the slaves... I don't know about the... But didn't they have to take care, take care of their slaves? They did have to take care of their yeah. slaves. And so, you, know, you had two different kinds. You had the ones that were... Um, they, they were Hebrew. They were more like bond servants. Mm -hmm. They weren't. Yeah, they were supposed to be freed every seven years. And then you had the people you conquered... You could take them as slaves. Oh, okay. oh so they were real slaves. Those were real slaves. Uh -huh. the Hebrews were considered bond servants. And, so they and had, had to treat to them with. well. Yeah. Yeah, no beating them. Right. But okay. That kind of thing. As far as living with them, if they I don't, I don't know. I don't know. You would, now the foreign slaves, yeah, obviously. Yeah. But I don't know. Okay, verse 16. Fathers shall not be put to death for their children, nor children put to death for their fathers. Each is to die for his own sin. Now, isn't that an yeah. interesting Old Testament concept? It is. <laughs> I mean, we, we know it from the New Testament, yeah. but it's, we see it in the Old Testament. But then we've seen things that say to the 10th ten generation. That the sins would be... Um, passed on. But the idea is a person is responsible for their own sin. When it says a, something is passed down for generation, generational sin, it's similar to the idea of in our society, um, an example is someone that's a child abuser. Right. His, his child tends to be a child abuser. And he, it just keeps going on a cycle. So that's more the idea. Here it's saying they are responsible for their own sin. Um, and you notice what's supposed to happen. Um, Audrey, I thought that they were responsible for their sin at a certain age. At this point, at this, well, we see the age of, we, we have the idea of age of accountability. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's hard to find that in the Bible. Oh. You, you won't see a thing that outright says age of accountability. Um, but I, I believe there's an age of accountability. Yeah. But finding it in the Bible, finding it spilled out in the Bible is kind of tough to, to find that. Um, notice in here three times it says put to death. Um, so a parent shall, should not be put to death because of the, the sins of their child. Children aren't put to death because of the sins of their father. You're put to death for your own sin. That's like these kids that are going and shooting kids at school and stuff like that. The, the parents uh, have some responsibility to know what their kids are doing, but that they're not being punished, the kids are being punished, and that's, 
I was thinking it's the way it should be. Yeah, <laughs> right. So um, we so have right here we have the case. That, um, I forgot what state where a child a, a kid went in and sh shot up a school and killed some of some students and the parents were put on trial too. Mm. Right. But oh, they that's... they they're being put on trial because of some things they did. In because they went and but... didn't that yeah, that's still they're still going to court on yeah, that they, because yeah. they got the kids a gun, I right. think. Yeah. Well they had guns too and they didn't lock them up. Yeah. They, so they, yeah. yeah. So they had committed sins too. Right. So and when it says because of their children it means because of their adult children. Their um, what? Adult children. Not little kids. Um, <laughs> what an adult child is, um, oh, we tend, yeah, adult. We tend to think 13 because that's when they yeah. kind of consider a boy to be a man. But it doesn't say that. It does say the children doesn't mean adult <laughs> children, though. Um, and there's times a whole family is, we'll see a whole family punished. We'll see Achan in Joshua yeah. 7. His whole family is punished. But it seems like maybe there was some kind of conspiracy. The whole family agreed on something. Don't know. Or the whole family was just so sinful that there was not one to be saved. Yeah. yeah. We'll have to see if we learn more when we get to that story, which is two books from now. Oh, okay, I'll show <laughs> Yeah, we're going to get <laughs> No, don't, don't worry about it. Okay, verse 17 and 18. You shall not pervert the justice due to the sojourner or the fatherless or take a widow's garment and pledge, but you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you from there. Therefore, I command you to do this. Okay, this is about compassion, especially for the widow. You were never to take a widow's um, garment in, in pledge because she was very needy and she didn't have someone to support her. Um, and this is because they were to remember when they were slaves. Now these guys here that are that Moses is talking to right now, most of them were not slaves in Egypt. It was their parents. But their family was slaves. God freed them from their slavery, and they they weren't treated with compassion. So God wants them to remember that, and that they need to treat each other with compassion and justice. Um, so that's basically a straightforward thing. Verses 19 through 22. When you reap your harvest in your field, and have forgotten a sheep in the field, you shall not go back to get it. It shall be for the alien, for the orphan, orphan, and for the widow, in order that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. When you beat your olive tree, you shall not go over the bounds again. It shall be for the alien, for the orphan, and for the widow. One more? That's one more. No, two more. Okay. 322. Okay. When you gather the grapes in your vineyard, you shall not go over it again. It shall be for the alien, for the orphan, and for the widow. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. Therefore, I am commanding you to do this thing. So again, we see why they're supposed to do it is because they've been through it. Mm -hmm. And they need to remember that they've been through it. Um, I One of my earlier jobs with the county was as an eligibility worker that helped people determine whether they were eligible for welfare benefits. And it was so strange to me that the, you know, you'd always hear stories about horrible workers and stuff. The one, workers that were the worst were the ones that had been on welfare themselves. Mm -hmm. It's like, wouldn't you think they'd have the compassion? But no, most, a lot of them were, were not very nice. Were they real judgmental? Very judgmental. And they they had been there. Mm -hmm. God's saying, you've been there. So have compassion on them. So we've seen this reaping thing before in a way. 
the previous instruction was leave the corners of your field but this takes it a whole lot farther um, it's it's a, a spirit of generosity so at the edges of the field it was usually inferior grain um, not the good stuff it was usually mixed with weeds um, grapes and olives same thing on the edge not as good so this allows people to get edible food mm -hmm. so as as the reapers came through and got their stuff they went through one time and then they were leave to leave whatever left um so the grapes they didn't get the first time those were for people to come through uh, uh, yeah interesting when I was visiting my daughter a few years ago, um, uh, she she lives close to the farmland, and then we were going through the potato field, mm -hmm. and, this, and there was lots of potato left. And I said, "Oh, what do you?" Uh, and then you see the tractor went and they collect potatoes, mm -hmm. and then she said, "Oh, yeah, they they leave that for those who doesn't have, and they come and uh, help themselves." And they're not such big potatoes, smaller, but it was nice to see that. Yeah. That's, that's exactly this principle. Yeah. Leave it. Um, in Hemet, there were some fields that were pumpkin fields. Mm -hmm. um, yep, when it was fall. And the harvesters would come get the good pumpkins and leave anything that wasn't worthwhile. And then they just laid there and rot. Yeah, they yeah. were like... And I would think, well, why don't you let people come get those yeah but no they just no surprise yeah no um this is god's welfare program for the poor a way to feed them um and it's not optional it's a command in california where we live <clears throat> they they would grow fields of onions and things like that uh and several different times when we were first married, uh, we would go and ask if we could, after they were done, take <coughs> stuff out of the field. And we did uh, several times. It was, you know, one time that was black eyed peas and another time it was onions. And uh, you would just get enough, you know, for you and your neighbor. And yeah. Uh, when my folks worked at the seminary in Portland, Oregon, one of the head guys, his family owned an apple orchard. And after they had picked the apples, they invited the seminary students and staff to come and pick oh, no. whatever was left. Yeah, yeah. And that's nice. But they don't do, I, I don't think they do that stuff. much anymore. Of course, yeah. we've never had to go and look and yeah. it, for quite a few years and look for anything that looks like that. Yeah. Yeah. So this this was another way for the poor person to keep their dignity. Mm -hmm. God was all about letting people have their dignity. They didn't have to go on the streets and well, beg for food. And they then Ruth it. Ruth goes and plays yeah, from this, yeah, the last we see this play into Ruth. Yeah. yeah. Yep. That's why they followed the reapers. Just whatever was left. And not just on the edges. Okay, Deuteronomy 25, uh, verse 1 through 3. When people have a dispute, they are to take it to court, and the judges will decide the case, acquitting the innocent and condemning the guilty. If the guilty person deserves to be beaten, the judge shall make them lie down and have them flogged in presence with the number of lashes the crime deserves. But the judge must not impose more than 40 lashes. If the guilty party is flogged more than that, your fellow Israelite will be degraded in your eyes. Okay, so this is a legal case between Hebrew brothers. Um, they were to take it to a court. This was to prevent personal revenge. Because personal <coughs> revenge tended to go overboard. Um 
So here, apparently God considers some criminals were wicked and deserved to be beaten. You could imagine there were probably very few frivolous lawsuits because if, if you lost and were determined to be wicked, you got a beating. Israel had four forms of punishment. They have the death penalty, stoning, fines, flogging, and then restitution. You don't see imprisonment. That only happened if a judgment was delayed, which they tended not to. If they said you were going to be stoned, they took you out and stoned you. They didn't wait on things. So when a flogging was appropriate, God wanted to make sure it didn't go overboard. Um, it was limited and it was done in the presence of the judge. When it says, um, mine says the judge caused cause him to lie down what it really means is it's done in in the witness of the judge he has to be there um, he has to watch this beating because he's the one that um, ordered it so cultures around them they would beat people mercilessly just mm. Yeah, no one like stopping now. the beating. <laughs> yeah. And you see Apostle Paul, how many times yeah. he lashes. So the judge could order up to 40 lashes, but no more than 40 lashes. And isn't that what Jesus got with 40 lashes? The tradition is that, well, later the rabbis say you can only do 39 lashes mm -hmm. because... What if you make a mistake and go over 40? So they did 39. And they would have the person doing the lashing um, and, the, and the counter. <coughs> Counting was very important. It's funny what they, what they really thought was important. They, and they forget some of the really important things. But it was important. Don't go over 30, 40 lashes. So the tradition is Jesus got 39 lashes. But scripture doesn't say that. Scripture doesn't say, it says he, he was beaten. So because they didn't beat anyone more than 39, it's thought Jesus had 39 lashes. But it doesn't say that. Oh. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't only once. Um, the reason no more than 40, because it would degrade the person. Now, why wouldn't you think one lash would degrade a person? <laughs> but, but apparently, more than 40 would really degrade a person. Could kill them. That one I don't understand. If you're really good at lashing, less than 40 could kill you. <laughs> you know? Well, I've always heard that the 40th one could cause death, too. Again, if, if depending on what you're using the lash, and it can could kill you. It did. They thought maybe more than 40 might kill you. Now, in the Code of Hammurabi, which is another culture, they permitted 60 lashes. Um, later, Assyrian laws permit between 40 and 50 lashes. It's interesting. In 2 Corinthians, it does say that they received, Jesus received 40 stripes, save one. That's Paul. Oh, it's Paul. Oh, <laughs> yeah, Paul. Oh, yeah. Five times. Five times five, he received right. 40 lashes minus one. Right. So. So it wasn't you. No, um, right. that yeah. Was and that, yeah, Second Corinthians, yeah, that's where he says it. Now, the other, re other reason we don't know if Jesus received 39 or 40 lashes, it wasn't he Hebrews lashing him. Right. It was Romans. Oh. They didn't have this law. They la they love lashing people. I had a disagreement with the pastor once because I, I was telling them these Romans liked violence. They said, "Oh no, they could no, they were they liked they killing people." I was going to say, and they have the Roman Colosseum. That's yeah, literally. they they were they these were Roman soldiers. They liked war. 
Um, but that's why Jewish they don't even want to do to Jesus. They give him to Romans. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If if they turn him over to the Romans, yeah, it's much. They know there's no limit on the lashes. But again, we have no idea how many lashes he had. But we know Paul. <laughs> yeah. Five times. <laughs> okay, Kelly, just for you. Verse four. That's hard. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I can read that. <clears throat> you shall not muzzle an ox when it is tending out the grain. Spreading out the grain. Okay, this is about the humane treatment of a working animal. So they would have a, an ox walk around in a circle on the grain and it would break the grain apart. It would break the husk away from um, away from the grain itself. So God is saying as the animal is working, don't muzzle him. Let him eat some of the grain while he's mm -hmm. while he's nice. walking around. A lot of owners were very greedy and wanted that ox mu muzzled because they didn't want to lose any profit from any of that grain. Mm -hmm. So they were being cruel to this animal that they're working. In 1 Corinthians 9.9 9 and 1 Timothy 5.18, Paul applied this to the minister's right to be uh, supported by those he ministers to. Um, and Paul was using this in what's called um, lesser to greater. If God cares that much about an oxen and their work, how much more does he care about someone preaching his word? You take care of them. Like yeah. If God is care, cares about an ox, how much more does he care about us? So, okay. What they do, uh -huh. uh, they put the pole in the, around this, and then they tie the uh, animal for the pole, and then they have a whip, and then animal go around, around, yeah. and around. Talk about a boring job. <laughs> Going around in circles. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Oaks, yeah. Yeah. But at least you got to eat some of the grain. Yeah. You know. Now you have to wonder how much grain he eats as he goes along, but he he he's taken care of. He has to be taken care of. Okay, this is a good size block, um, verses five through ten. What do you, Mary, you want to do that? It's five to what? Ten. Okay. I thought it was five, so. That's okay. If brothers are living together and one of them dies without a son, his widow must not marry outside the family. Her husband's brother shall take her and marry her and fulfill the duty of a brother-in-law to her. The first son she bears shall carry on the name of the dead brother so that his name will not be blotted out from Israel. However... If a man does not want to marry his brother's wife, she shall go to the elders at the town gate and say, My husband's brother refuses to carry on his brother's name in Israel. He will not fulfill the duty of a brother-in-law to me. Then the elders of his town shall summon him and talk to him. If he persists in saying, I do not want to marry her, his brother's widow shall go up to him in the presence of the elders, take off one of his sandals, <laughs> spit in his face, and say, this is what is done to the man who will not build up his brother's family's line. That man's line shall be known in Israel as the family of the unsandaled. Uh, <laughs> so, now, where do, where do we see this kind of carried out? Anyone? Yeah. Ruth? Ruth? I would see this in Ruth. Yeah. You see this in Ruth? Um, so this concept is called the Leverite marriage. In Latin, the word for brother-in-law is lever. So, Leverite mar marriage. Notice, though, something interesting. This starts off with, if the brothers dwell together. 
Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. They were on the same property. That means living close enough to share pasture land. Mm -hmm. So if your brother live, your brother in law lives far away, this doesn't apply. Oh. Yeah. So in the story of Ruth, they're all in the same area. That's one thing we see. Remember to them, descendants are so important mm -hmm. to carry on the family name. So if a man dies without a son, that's a tragedy. Mm -hmm. So the solution is <coughs> that she marries her brother-in-law. The first child is considered the brothers and has all the inheritance. The other thing it provides is care for the widow because a child is to take care of his mother. Mm. Um, the son, the, the, the male yeah, child. The, yeah. Notice it doesn't say anything about whether the brother-in-law is married or not. Already married. Don't say. He, he might already be married. It was a responsibility of the brother to give the widow a child. Um, we see the case of Judah. He forgot about Tamar. Is that so? Um, yeah, that, we saw that back in Genesis with Judah and Tamar. And Judah was supposed to give when Tamar's husband died. He was supposed to give the next son or give her to the next son and she was supposed to have a child by him and he didn't do that and he kept there were several sons he went through those and then it was the youngest son and he was still not doing it so she slept with her father-in-law instead tricked him into sleeping with her but that was the same concept so this concept precedes this it goes back to back to Genesis um but this isn't a mandatory command. Because if it were a mandatory command, the brother-in-law would be stoned. Or so, there'd be some other kind of punishment. But the consequences were considered kind of repugnant. You didn't want to go through. through. They were hu humiliating. <laughs> um, so if he refuses, out to the city gate where the judges are. Um, and she pulls off her sand, his sandal. And when it says she pulls off her sandal, it means she forcefully pulls it off. She jerks it off him. Um, and then spits in his face. Um, it's a random punishment. <laughs> yeah. But, it, you know, we've seen how God is, cares about people's dignity. This is the opposite of dignified. Oh. This is taking away his dignity. It's so silly, sounds, you know. It... So the reason for the sandal is when a man took possession of property, he walked around it with his sandal. I mean, sandal yeah. feet. So by having his sandal taken off, is it means he is, he is not entitled to the property of his brother. He's not. No. Oh. Because so where does it go? They're, good. they're going to keep going. Th if there's more brothers, they keep going through the brothers. Oh, oh and then gotcha. if there's okay. if there's no one, then maybe he doesn't have any. Uh, yeah, right, right, right. Okay. So something interesting that came up when I was studying this: when they surveyed their land, they surveyed in triangles. What? Where we we survey in like rectangles or try to get a rectangle shape. They did triangles. So. Thought that was interesting. Yeah. Um, so again, taking off the sandal symbolized that he gave up the right to any land and his brother's inheritance. Um, but she couldn't own the land, so she couldn't, so it wouldn't be. But it stayed, whoever married her got the land, it stayed with her. So, so someone would eventually back to want the that land. Law eventually, maybe, like it did in. in yeah. And then spitting in the face would be just like you would think, just humiliating. Yeah. yeah. So most most men would just 
take care of the business. After after she has a child, <laughs> after she has a child, he doesn't have to pay any attention to her at all. I mean, he, so okay. to get land, you may have to sleep with your brother's wife. So, and like in Tamar's case, the last brother was too young to marry her, so they were waiting. So you could be the wife could be considerably <laughs> older. <laughs> Oh, no. Fast time to be able to have got children. Yeah, they got pregnant easy back then. I'm sure God gave them, made them fertile. Well, well they some had, did. Like it. Yeah, there was Sarah who didn't. Yeah, we we see lots. It it was. It was a. But that was for a reason. Thing. But they they had infertility and things back then too. But yeah, everything was about having children yeah. to carry on your inheritance. Okay, now we're going to get into another really weird one. Okay. <laughs> Verse 11 and 12. If two men are fighting with each other and the wife of one steps in to rescue her husband from the one striking him and she puts out her hand <laughs> you are to cut off her hand. You must not show pity. Okay. Oh, wow. This is... This is like a, this scene seems just really strange. Um, Why would she do that? Well, she's defending her husband. Um, but, and nothing's wrong, nothing's wrong with defending your husband, but her tactics were wrong. Um, from, and from the grammar, this isn't an innocent gesture. It's not like she grabbed him in the wrong place by accident. No, she went after his jewels. <laughs> Um, her actions deliberate and it is so like we've just said having children is important and it she might harm him and make it where he can't have children anymore um, so it was considered a serious matter now it just seems like why this situation why not just not <laughs> Um, and it's the only place we see this. Um, Maybe it works. <laughs> <laughs> they deterrent, don't. Yeah, don't. <laughs> so there's a lot of suggestions on what, why such a severe punishment. Uh, again, maybe because of protecting the man's ability to have children. Um, it seems the most likely. And it says, no pity take no pity which means it was likely people were going to take pity they were going to say she was just defending her husband no pity it's serious i mean if you think about it she defiled her her husband herself right. and god by doing it so yeah, yeah. There should be no pity in the sense we see it as well, that's just god yeah but she defiled herself yeah. and her husband she did. What did she do? What is she doing? Um, and it's almost like saying he wasn't man enough to take care of himself. <laughs> I mean, I would, I can see where that would be pretty. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, in the eyes of God, it's the same as cheating on your husband. You've touched something that you should not touch. You have done something yeah. you should not do. Yeah. Now here's your punishment. Well, and again, the biggest issue was you might have kept him from being able to have children yeah. and descendants. So that, that was the big thing about all this time. Um, this is the only example of putative mutilation, of cutting something off as a punishment. Oh. I mean, we'll see people, John the, John the Baptist, his head was cut off, but it was cut off in a whole different way. But only place in the law that it says mutilate someone. I wonder what we would do in this world today if we had those same kind of punishment. I, I think it'd be a different. Be yeah. Yeah. I think it'd be a different world. Mm -hmm. Well, there are countries who still do that. Some, yeah, yeah. Some, you, well, you remember yeah. years ago the boy that got caned because he got 
kind of shoplifting or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And oh, it cost a yeah. lot of yeah. There was a big thing over here about it. Yeah. They were trying yeah. to stop it. was it. an American that got. Yeah, it was an American <laughs> boy that got caught shoplifting. Yeah. And did you should he get know, but, stoned, I forget. I, well, it was or Kane. Kane. I don't yes. remember if that if it happened or not. Most of the countries, many things happen like this. Yeah. So, but I bet their crime rate is a whole mm -hmm. different thing. Yeah. Um, so this is an, another example of an eye for an eye right. punishment, the Lex Talianus. Um, but obviously, she didn't have the parts to do the same exact thing. So it was her hand instead because she didn't have the male she parts. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and a, again, this would be a real deterrent to leave men alone. Don't touch them <laughs> where you don't belong. Okay, verse 13 through 16. You must not have two different weights in your bag, one heavy and one light. You must not have two differing dry measures in your house, a larger and a smaller. You must have a full and honest weight, a full and honest dry measure, so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. For everyone who does such things and acts unfairly is detestable to the Lord your God. Okay, so this is about the commandment about do not steal. Not, not cheating each other. Now they used weights when they were buying and selling because they didn't have coins. So they, they traded in goods, but they weighed the goods. So this is about a deceptive person that has two different size weights. All their weights were supposed to be the same weight. They The weight was an ephah, which, you know, normally about four pounds. And they were to be the exact same thing. But this guy used a heavy weight when he sold things and a lighter weight when he was buying things. Yeah. So that he would get more things. And, um, just cheat people that way. Another kind of measurement they used was a pot or, or a basket. Had to be the same size pot or basket for everybody. Um, and this was taking advantage of people that had nowhere else to turn. They needed that help. God wanted honesty. Um, everything was to be measured correctly. And God hates that kind of sin. It's an abomination to him. He hates when people steal. Isn't it too bad people today don't take that seriously? God our, hates it. Yeah, our minister, when I grew up, before he um, became a minister and even knew that he won, was going to eventually become one, he was a butcher. And he <laughs> says he used to, um, when he would measure, you know, put his little finger on the scale and make, yeah. you know, cheat people that way. And he he felt when he became a Christian, he just remembered all the people that he had cheated by doing that. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. And he always talked about it. So Amos eight five, which is another one that's much later, he condemns people that are doing this. So we know they don't obey this law completely either. So <sighs> Okay, ending this chapter, verses 17 through 19. Remember what Elimelech did to you on the way as you were coming out of Egypt. Coming out of Egypt. <clears throat> How he met you on the way and attacked you, attacked your rear ranks. All the stragglers of the rear. Sorry, that hurts a little too small. <laughs> when you were tired and weary and he did not fear God. Therefore it shall be when the Lord your God has given you rest for your enemies all around in the land which which the Lord your God 
is giving you to possess as an inheritance, that you will blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. You shall not forget. Okay, so we saw this incident back in Exodus 17. The, the Israelites are traveling through and these Amalekites just attacked them in a cowardly way. They went after the rear of the train, their group where the slowest and the weakest were following. And they attacked in a bad way. Um, and later Joshua is going to lead an attack against them and he's going to be victorious. But he's not going to wipe them out yet. Now, important phrase in here, why it was so important, is where it says, and he did not fear God. The Amalekites did not fear God. He attacked, they attacked God's people. God wanted them wiped out. Now, they're not in Canaan. So he tells them, once you take over Canaan, you go wipe those Amalekites out. They became a symbol of evil to the Israelites because of their raiding techniques, going after the weak. There's some that see the Amalekites as a symbol of our flesh, which constantly battles against the spirit, in a, and it, it won't raid in nice ways. It'll, it'll come attack you at your weakest, but that's reading a lot into it. Now, 400 years later, Saul is king, and God commands him to make war against the Amalekites and completely destroy them. He doesn't. He has mercy on their king. And that's the reason God removed him, removed Saul as king, because he didn't obey. And it's going to come back to bite him. Um, the Amalekites are going to burn a village and take all the women and children captive, including two of David's wives. Now, David will attack and, and rescue all the hostages and kill the Amalekites that are there. But a few hundred Amalekites escape. The next time we hear about the Amalekites is in the book of Esther. Haman is a descendant of Agog, the king that Saul did not kill. And he hates the Hebrews because the Hebrews almost wiped out his people. That's why he is so adamant about killing Mordecai. If Saul had gotten rid of him, there wouldn't have been an enemy in Esther. So our, our actions have consequences. God knows what he's talking about when he says, says to do something. Okay, we're going to go into the next chapter. Verses 1 through 4. When you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you as a special possession, and you have conquered it and settled there, put some of the first produce from each crop you harvest into a basket and bring it to the designated place of worship, the place the Lord your God chooses for his name to be honored. Go to the priest in charge at that time and say to him with this gift I acknowledge to the Lord your God that I have entered the land he swore to our ancestors he would give us the priest will then take the basket from your hand and set it before the altar of the Lord your God okay so they've got formidable obstacles ahead they're re getting ready to cross the Jordan River but it's springtime and that river is flooded at this time so it's not a, a, a nice small river it is a flooding river and they're going to have to cross it and then once they get across it are those pesky Canaanites that they're going to have to fight but God assures them they are still going to get that land he's giving them that land 
So we first saw the idea of the first fruits back in Numbers 18, 12, but this seems to be a special offering from the very first harvest they have in the promised land. A special like ceremony. They're going to honor God by giving the, him the very first, the very best. They're going to take it to the place that God has chosen. Now, that it's the place where God chooses to have his sanctuary. At this point, it's the tabernacle. Later, it's going to be the temple. So, it's going to be originally set up in Gilgal. So, they take the first fruits to Gilgal. Later, it's going to be Shechem, then Shiloh, then Mizpah, and eventually Jerusalem. So, that tabernacle is going to move a little bit. But the first first fruits are going to go to Gilgal. Okay, verse 5 through 10. Then you shall declare before the Lord your God, My father was a wandering Aramean, and he went down into Egypt with a few people, and lived there and became a great nation, powerful and numerous. But the Egyptians mistreated us and made us suffer, putting us to hard labor. Then we cried out to the Lord, the God of our fathers, and the Lord heard our voice and saw our misery, toil, and oppression. So the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, with great terror and with miraculous signs and wonders. He brought us to this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And now I bring the first fruits of the soil that you, O oh Lord, have given me. Place the basket before before him. Um, okay, so this was um, like a theological statement about being God's people. And why there are God's people, their history. Um, they, when it talks about a wandering Aramean or yours might say Syrian, this is talking about Jacob, later called Israel. So why is he a wandering Aramean and a Syrian? Um, yeah. Because when he ran from Esau and his parents, he ran to his uncle who lived in Syria, who was an Aramean. His wives are Aramean. So, and he lived there for quite a while. So he's called the wandering Aramean. Um, when he comes back, they're nomadic, so they wander around. And then he wanders into Egypt, where they spend 400 years. But God considers that 400 years nothing more than a sojourn. A temporary stopping, stopping off place. 400 years. That's almost twice the age of our country. 400 years is a long time. But it was just a temporary thing. And while they were there, they, they had some miserable times. Not the whole 400 years. It started off great, but then got worse and worse until they were slaves. And they could have focused on all the hard times. And it seems like a lot of times they did. Mm -hmm. Especially when they complained in the Vietnams. Yeah. But they still had God. There might be some hard things you're going through. I know I've gone through hard things. And you can sit there and mourn and feel sorry for yourself. Or you can remember you have God. Yeah. Um, and... God might have you in a temporary journey. One of my pastors used to say, imagine your life in five years. You may be going through something right now, but what will your life be in five years? Will you still be going through the same thing? And likely not. When Jacob's family left the Canaan, Canaan into Egypt, they came as a family. When they leave 400 years later, they leave as a nation. And this is because God brought them to a place that was so racist that none of the Egyptians would ever marry an Israelite. 
So he kept the Israelites pure. Um, verse 8 talks about God with a mighty hand, an outstretched arm. That's a symbol of his power. If you look at a lot of pagan statues and Egyptian statues, their hands are out as a symbol of power. But God has the real power. It talks about the great deeds of terror with signs and wonders. Talk about the plagues. So all this is to say, giving God the first fruits, we so owe it to him. It was an appropriate way to give thanks. Give up a little bit of what you have to thank God who gave you everything you have. Mm -hmm. And it's still something we should do to today. It, what he gives us, we give back to him. So, And I think we will end there. Mm -hmm. All because Wanda can't wait. We should thank him every day that we're breathing. We should. There is always something. So next, next, which was next time? We pick up at 11, verse 11. Okay, and I'm going to turn the camera off.